Good morning. I'm very pleased to be here to talk about balsam fir because it was the species that I, I spent oh, a long, long time studying in detail. And my PhD thesis uh, was a product of three of, or well, five years actually, of study of individual trees. I came to New Brunswick and to University of New Brunswick in 1960, following a degree in forestry at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. So I emigrated here to Canada and uh, I've worked. When, when I finished my master's degree, I came here to take a master's degree. And when I finished the master's degree in 1961, I was asked to stay with the faculty and so I stayed there and worked up to professor position. And I was there for 37 years, uh, giving courses in trees, dendrology, silviculture, tree development and reproduction. And my emphasis towards the end of the time was re forest re tree reproduction, which I have continued right to now, as you'll see a little later. When we look at the balsam fir seed cone and pollen cone zones, we find that they are right at the tops of the trees and they don't occupy as much space as the zones do in spruces, tamarack larch, eastern white pine, eastern hemlock and jack pitch and red pines. Now, in 1964, I started 10 years of study on the tops of balsam fir trees. And I had these towers built, or we built these towers around the trees. In the early part of the year, July, August, we had these cages put around the tops of the trees. And every time we went to measure something, it was about three times a week, we had to take the top off to reach the parts we were measuring. Well, we decided that the squirrels weren't too much of a bother on the trees that we saw around us. So we stopped doing that and we took the cages off in September. And so from then on, we had nothing other than ourselves up there on the tops of the trees. The little white box you see on the right is a place where we had maximum and minimum temperatures recorded for that year. The diagram at the top of the tree in a moderate seed cone year. And we see the cones born on three different whorls here, one, two, and three, and on the internodal branches between the whorls. And we get right down in the bottom, at the bottom of this, that where the branches are weaker, the cone bearing is not the same. This is a, brand, a shoot from the top of the tree. And on it, we see we we have three seed cone buds, quite prominent because they are large, much larger than vegetative buds. On the left, there is a, a section through a seed cone bud. We see the cone sitting in the middle and there's a nodal diaphragm across the bottom of it, separating it from the pith below. And the pith here is separated from the nodal diaphragm. You see there's quite a lot, substantial amount of uh, bud scale tissue outside the cone. Inside the cone, we can see the central axis and then the darker areas are the vascular tissues going up to service the cone. That was in October. Then in March, when we took the, some bud scales from a bud, this is what we see inside with the spirally arranged bracts having grown a little bit more since October. Now this is a shoot a couple, with three shoots from the pollen cone zone showing the pollen cone buds, one bud in the axle of each needle. And then this was for a very heavy pollen cone production year. So there are masses of buds showing. cut through one of those, we make a section in mid-August, we see the beginning of the cone in the middle. Uh, 
forming some of the micro microsporophylls in which the pollen grains will be developing when we get to the next year. Now here we get to mid-October and in the pollen cone section we see the microsporophylls with dark tissue inside which is the sporogenous tissue which will be developing later into pollen cones. And on the right we see a cone uh, with the bud scales removed, just pale green with the bulges where the microsporophylls are. If we take a section through in the next April, we find inside those microsporophylls, the zone where the sporogenous tissue was has developed with a lot of cells obviously there. On the right is a closer view of some of them, and you can actually see pollen grains there uh, with wings. There's one at the bottom, in the bottom one on the left, two bladders on either side of the pollen grain. This is what the pollen cones look like when they've come out of their buds on the undersides of shoots. They vary in color. Most of them are purple, but we see occasionally like the yellow one and then the orangey colored one. And these colors were consistent year after year on those 14 trees. It's late May. And this is also late May after some of them have shed their pollen. The pollen cones have grown out on their axes and split the microsporophylls. So pollen gets into the air from there, masses of it from these trees. At the same time, the, the seed cones are coming out of their buds. We see here on May the 13th on the left, cone is just pushing through the buds at the tip of the, the bud scales at the tip of the cone. The cone in the middle, three days later, the bracts are separating and growing quite large, relatively speaking. And what is it, 11 days later on the right, this is a cone at the receptive stage when pollen can get into between the bracts, which are the yellowish green things sticking out. The dark patches you can see inside the cone are the beginnings of the ovuliferous scales growing out each one in the axle of a bract. If we compare 13 trees here that I was studying in those years, uh, the colors of the seed cones at the time of receptivity vary quite a bit. And there's no consistency in the colors of the pollen cones and colors of these, but each color is consistent year after year on the same tree. If we take one of the bracts out and look at the ovuliferous scale that is set at the base of it, and on the right we see where it's been pulled away from the axis of the cone. The ovule on one side, you can see on coming from the ovuliferous scale, there's a similar ovule the other side of the scale, and down below, we have the integument with attached pollen. It's got some pollen grains just visible there around. The Section down through a seed cone at the time of receptivity to pollen. The various parts are labeled, the axis in the middle, the bracts all the way down on either side. An ovule is shown with the O's developing on ovuliferous scales, which you can see are small structures. The, uh, in the middle of some of the ones labeled O, the ovules, we can see the gametophyte tissue, the female gametophyte tissue forming inside. And from the oviliferous scale, we have ovules developing, and the dark tissues are where the business of the ovule is, is, is 
occurring. N is the, the surface onto which pollen will be placed or enabled to get through the micropyle between the integuments, which are labeled I, which is like a, a funnel shaped tip to the ovule, but it's hanging down. So the pollen grains would have to come in this way <laughs> and reach the integuments. If we look at a cone which has been split apart, so that we're looking at it from the bottom up in the middle of we see bracts all around and oviliferous scales are on the upper sides of the bracts but one bract has left its oviliferous scale up at the top there and on either side of the base of the oviliferous scales we could just see rounded areas with pollen grains on the right in the integuments that are showing there and on the left the integuments are still there but there are very few pollen grains attached to them which suggests that this cone was sitting up with something impeding the access of pollen on the left as opposed to the right and the bottom then the as we get through late may into early june we see the oviliferous scales growing up between the bracts and sealing the cones from entry of anything else at that stage. Follow some cones here. This is June the 8th. The oviliferous scales are pushing out further. There's some resin exuding at the tops of the cones. I don't know why that happens, but every year they all have them. This is when the shoots are beginning to extend from the buds at the end. And we take this to June the 22nd. The shoots are a bit further advanced, the cones too. The, the scales have pretty well overgrown the bracts, though you can see at the bottom there are some tips of the bract horns showing. Same cones, July the 9th, when shoot elongation will have come to an end and cone uh, increases in size. Cone growth will also have come to an end. If we compare cones from 13 of the 14 trees in one of the years picked from similar positions in the crown, we see differences between the trees in sizes and shapes of the cones. The, the excavation of resin has been scraped away. So we see the tips of the cone showing up. It's mid-July when full-grown growth is achieved. At that time, if we take a cone apart and we look at scales up the cones, there are five cones represented here, scales from similar positions up the cones. And it's the ones in the central parts that you can see there are ovules, maybe seeds by this time, forming at the basis of the cones. And you see differences in shapes from the different cones. This is mid-July, we take a closer look. The, the one on the left is, I think, a fully formed seed. The one on the right, the seed is not developing, so it's probably an empty seed or one that has an insect in it. It's the upper view. Go back to our three cones. We can see here that the color has changed. They darken and we get a brownish tinge. What is happening there is that this, the little hairs that come out from the scales, which were colorless at first, have now turned brown. And then gradually the scales too will be forming brown. See the resin exudation is quite obvious. What has been happening here, the growth, we see the length extending up and then at the end of May there is a sort of lessening in the height growth. That's the period of pollination when the cone is open. And then up from there 
It increases in length as the cone grows to full size by about mid-July. Towards the bottom, there's the width, also has a bulb in its development late May, and then it picks up and reaches full size, full width by the middle of July. The moisture content at the top increases quite have quite a lot at the beginning of the year and it's held steady through May into June. Maybe picks up a little bit as the scales grow larger and the seeds begin to form and then the moisture content gradually decreases, doing so in quite rapidly end of August. The other line, the dashed line, which goes up to the top there, the weight of the cone increasing up to, well, it goes beyond the middle of July because inside the cone, we have seeds developing which increase in weight. And that is the result of the, the top of the line there. Go back to our three cones or four cones on that shoot. We see here the cones have dried up and the scales are separating. And in some, we can see the wings of the seeds showing. That's the end of August. September, scales have fallen away from the, from the, the axis of the cone, from two of them, not the third one, which was more sheltered. The end of September, though, that one has also shed most of its scales and the seeds into the air. The axes remain upright on the trees and are visible. I've counted them back for 38 years on some tree. This is the end of September. And these are the seeds, the kind of seeds that we will have. The one on the left is the underside as it was developing. There's a little gap, but the wing is held right around the seed itself, except for that lighter colored patch towards the right. The upper side, it's all the same glossy brown. Back to our cones, this is May the 15th, the next year. They're still there and uh, buds for the growth for the following year, the third year, are extending at this stage. This is a shot of the same tree, but on the left, we have more of it showing at the top of the tree with the seed cone zone. And you can see there that the, the green of the tree is much paler than lower down. So the development of the cones has taken quite a bit out of the tree. It's the same top of the tree on the right, but here we can see cones on the second world down, the third world, fourth world, and fifth world down. And there's even a cone right at the bottom right on the fifth world of the year in which the cones were produced. Here we go back to the cone zones, showing how they do overlap in a heavy bearing year, but they overlap not on the same shoots, but on the weaker shoots, we have the pollen cones forming. And if you look at the different zones, they tend to be towards the outside of the tree, towards the, the bottom of the zones, because the shoots are generally weaker in those areas. Now, in the years when I was studying these trees in detail, we collected cones at various stages and uh, we counted the number of cone scales. We laid them out on a sheet of paper and we were able to see how they were. And we find that the numbers of scales, the sizes of the cones, decrease from world to world down the tree. You see 191, 174, 157, 
142 and 134 as average numbers of scales through the worlds. If we look at the interworlds, we have a similar decrease, 187 to 156, 144. And then on the right, we can see what's happening back along a branch. And it seems there are decreases in the sizes of the cones. The numbers of seed cones born by each of the seven of seven balsam fir trees here show the three different cone bearing years. 1964, 66 was the heaviest cone year, and 68 was okay, but not not so many on some of the trees. Take tree five; it was a heavy bearer. 100, 499 in 1964. 631 in 1966, but only 45 in 1968. No cones were produced in 1963, 1965, 1967, or 1969. Very definite biennial production of cones in balsam fir. Now the seed proficiency, seed production efficiency of the cones. Uh, this is an indication here on four trees. Numbers of cones produced in 1964 and 1966 are shown. But the seed production efficiency in 1964, the numbers are lesser than the numbers in 1966, indicating that when we have a greater cone year, the proportion of sound seeds in the cones is better than it is in a lesser cone year. Look at the seeds from each from cones of each of five trees here. This is a September shot. We have two seeds side by side from each of the five trees going up the cone from the bottom up to the top. And it's only the seeds in the middle three lines here that really would be of much value. There's not much likelihood of sound seeds, except in the middle one there, that's pretty good size in some of the seeds. And these are the seeds shown underside and upper side, side by side. And all of these shots come from my book, Lives of Conifers comparative account of the coniferous trees indigenous to northeastern North America. That book was published in 2009. And I've been working since then on another book with a similar sort of account of the trees. This is for birches, ironwood and maples. It's in process of being published by the same publishers as the first one. It's Henry and Whiteside, but they're taking an awful. Thank you very much.